welcome to this webcast. Feel free to ask your questions during the presentation by entering them in the space provided. They will be answered after the presentation. We wish you a good webcast. Yes, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, BCF is hosting this webinar to uh, provide you with a 360 degree view of the new uh, Bill 96, uh, which amended notably the Charter of the French Language, and to help us with uh, these aspects um, uh, that you'll need to consider to uh, to better your, your business here in Quebec or, or uh, counsel your, your clients here in Quebec for those of you who are outside counsel. Uh, we have Sean Finn, which will uh, address especially the uh, effects on, on litigation and uh, the courts. Uh, Nancy Boyle will uh, will discuss the issues of uh, labor and employment. Good morning. Gilles Seguet will uh, uh, talk to you about the commercial aspects the, uh, of, of, of the bill. Good morning. And uh, I myself will uh, uh, <coughs> talk about the trademarks and uh, labeling and uh, public signage. So without any further ado, I'll pass the mic on to Mr. Finn. Thank you uh, very much, Pascal, and I apologize in advance. I'm suffering a tiny bit from allergies, so if I start sneezing, please don't be offended. I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to hold it in if I can, but I can't promise. As long as it's not COVID. <clears throat> no, yeah, definitely it. not. <laughs> definitely not. Definitely not. It's pollen. It's pollen. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, before delving into uh, all of the juicy details, the nitty gritty of this very significant piece of legislation, which I've brought a copy of, you can see it's not exactly slim. Uh, we thought that it would be useful to give you some sense of the nature uh, of this law and the scope of this law, which is obviously very important. And the fact that there are many people joining us today, thankfully, is an indication of just how important it is. So the name of, uh, of this piece of legislation in English, because there is an English version of the statute, is an act respecting French, the official and common language of Quebec. And in case you were not aware, this, this what used to be called Bill 96 has been adopted. And it was adopted on May 24th, 2022. And uh, interestingly enough, ironically enough, perhaps it received royal assent on June 1st, which means that for all practical purposes, uh, this piece of legislation exists. However, not all of it is currently in force. And that's something that my colleagues are going to talk to you a little bit about. I will as well. Some of the provisions are in force now. Others will come into force in about two and a half months, others in a year, others in two years, others, I think, even later than that. So it's really an ongoing rolling schedule that we're dealing with. What is this piece of legislation all about? It's obviously very long. Um, I, would, I think I would encourage everyone to read it if you have the, the time and the energy to do so. But at the very least... I think that it is worth looking at the explanatory notes, which are about four or five pages long and very useful because they really set the table uh, for the legislation. And I'm going to cite one very interesting sentence that captures, I think, the essence of, uh, of the legislation. The act, quote, is to affirm that the only official language of Quebec is French, it also affirms that French is the common language of the Quebec nation. And I think it's important to keep in mind that this, uh, this statute, this piece of legislation is not a standalone statute. In other words, it's not a charter or a statute in and of itself. It's rather legislation that modifies various other pieces of legislation and statutes most notably the Charter of the French Language and um, the Code of, of Civil Procedure, which I will turn to in a moment. And I think it's important to bear in mind that this piece of legislation is both outward looking and it's inward looking, which makes it particularly important. Outward looking, why? Because it affects 
all of us. It affects citizens. Uh, it affects what are called natural persons, which, which is just a, a fancy way of saying living, breathing uh, human beings like you and I. And it also affects legal persons. In other words, companies, enterprises of various types and institutions. But beyond that, so it's outward looking, but beyond that, it is also introspective and inward looking because it also targets the state and the ministries of the state and the entire governmental apparatus. So it is both outward looking and inward looking. And so I think that the way to think about the legislation is really, it is constitutional legislation because it touches on the constitution and it also touches on quasi-constitutional instruments as we will see. So without overstating it or overselling it, I would say that in a sense, I don't know if you guys would agree with this, but in a sense, it's a reiteration or a new vision of the social contract in Quebec. I would agree with that, John, definitely. And it changes a lot of things, especially in labor and employment law. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and what is particularly fascinating is that it creates another governmental layer as well, because now we have a new ministry, a ministry of the French language with a minister, a minister of the French language, who will be the justice minister, so Mr. Jalin Barrette, a deputy minister and a commissioner whose job will be to inquire and to make sure uh, that this legislation is being faithfully implemented. And Sean, also it will touch into immigration because they're going to be uh, creating a new organism, which is going to be the uh, Francisation Quebec, which is targeting immigration, apart from the OLF, which is the, uh, of, of course, the governing body or the, the French police, as we call them in, in Quebec. I did not use that term. That was my colleague, Nancy <laughs> Boyle, who used that term. I want that to be cl <laughs> clearly stated in the minutes. French police. French police. Yeah. Everybody knows what I mean. <laughs> very careful. In yeah, as Sean Finn has to be very careful in terms of what he says. But you're right. And so it, 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 what, it, so it has the effect of impinging on various areas, as you said, uh, commerce and real estate, employment, uh, insurance, immigration, healthcare, education, the administration of justice, so the court mm -hmm. system, as, as Pascal had mentioned in his introduction, and also the relations between the state and those with whom uh, the state interacts, whether, again, they be natural persons or whether they be legal persons. And I'm going to stop there for a second to say that there is a distinction between the two in that the law is more onerous, I think, when it comes to legal persons, so businesses, yeah. than it is with respect to ordinary people like, again, you and I. What is it that this statute touches upon? What other pieces of legislation? Because I said... Uh, before that it's sort of constitutional in nature. Well, it would affect the Constitution Act 1867. And I think the federal government will have to agree with that. But what it want, what it purports to do is to include in the constitutional text a provision to the effect that Quebec is a nation. And that's already been declared actually by the Harper government in the House of Commons, but this would really codify it. And that, that Quebec is a nation and that Quebec's only official language is French. So that, that would be changed. The Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms would be changed. And here we're talking about the Quebec Charter, uh, not the Canadian Charter. The Charter of the French Language, that really is at the core, I think, of, the, of this major reform. The Civil Code of Quebec, the Code of Civil Procedure, which is sort of my wheelhouse. It's what I deal with pretty much every day, uh, the Labor uh, Code and the Consumer Protection Act. And, um, and, and one thing that, that you should keep in mind as well is that this is not simply words on a page. It's not a statement of intent. Uh, it has teeth. This is legislation with teeth, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And there are fines and penalties that are imposed um, for, for offenses that can range anywhere from 700 bucks, which is a you know, considerable amount of money, all the way to $90,000. For a third which, offense. For a third offense. A and, so there, and that's right. Yeah. There's this idea of recidivism. And so what is this law about? Well, in part, it's about modifying behavior. It's providing 
all sorts of incentives to do uh, the only, uh, yeah, sound, it could also nullify contracts yes and uh, recall any authorization of license that the company could have or a natural person could have. so there, there are many uh, also prevent a company from doing business with the government yeah obtaining government contracts yeah yeah, so it's again, a lot of ramifications. Absolutely, yeah. a huge amount of, of ramifications, which now brings me to my tiny little, or not so tiny, part mm -hmm. of the legal universe, which is that of civil procedure and, and litigation. And I think that this is something that may interest some of our friends who are in house counsel. Um, first of all, the language of legislation itself. Um, according, according to the law, according to this new piece of legislation, if there is a contradiction, or maybe not a contradiction, but discrepancy between the English version of a statute and the French version of a statute, the courts, and again, I think this could possibly be open to a challenge. I'm, I'm not a constitutional expert. I don't know. But now the courts are called upon to favor the French version of the statute. And that's a difference because historically in Quebec, it's particularly true of the civil code, but I think it's true of statutes in general, is that both versions are equally authoritative. And in the case of a discrepancy, normally what you'll do is you'll try to, as a, as a judge, determine, well, which is the most coherent and which of the versions is more consistent with the legislative purpose. And this is sort of adopting a much more formalistic linguistic approach to statutory construction. So that's an interesting point. Here's the big one, as far as I'm concerned, as a, as a commercial litigator, this is the big one. And that is that in about two and a half months, every pleading, or as we say in French, acte de procédure, every civil procedure will have to be filed at the very least in French. And if it's filed in English, it must attach a French translation. Uh, and when I say French translation, and it has to be certified. No, it's a certified translation. Well, you see, you're smarter than I am. Yes, yeah, so you're, you're already you're already five feet ahead of me. Exactly. Yeah, because a certified translation will cost you more money. Oh, also. oh, yes. So in other words, that means that you just you cannot take your procedure and just put it into Google Translate, pump something out within five minutes, attach it, mm -hmm. file it at the court. No, 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 no. And what does certified mean? It means that it has to be certified by a translator who's a, a member in good standing of okay. the order, Quebec Order of Translators. I think that this is an appropriate time for a shameless plug, because I would just mention to you, as you may already know, we have a magnificent translation service right here at BCF. But Gilles is in charge of it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, 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 I'm foreshadowing. I'm not telling. I'm just foreshadowing. And we have very modest and humble fees. <laughs> that's, that's right. But you can imagine you can imagine the volume that we're that we're talking about here mm -hmm. and you can also imagine the practical consequences of this because in again i'm speaking for my practice i have the the pleasure and the honor of representing clients from all over the place including from the united states other parts of this great country other parts of the world and when we're drafting procedures well typically we're drafting them and preparing them in english constantly getting feedback from the client so how do we approach the task, the important task of drafting. Are we now going to get instructions from the client, draft in French, and then provide later on the client with a with an English version? Are we going to be doing it in English, but with a simultaneous French translation? Where are we going to find the translators to respond to this huge new uh, need? Uh, because again, we're, it's not just any old translator, it's someone who's certified and there's a relatively limited number of people, which raises questions. I mean, it raises logistical questions, questions of cost, but also questions of access to justice. Yeah. Sean, I have a question. Does it apply to natural persons as well? Companies and uh, legal persons? Okay, that's an excellent that's question. That's a good question, I'm yeah. Very, I'm very glad that you asked it because it doesn't apply to natural persons, but it applies to legal persons. Again, Okay. Poids de mesure. So we're not treating individual. not yeah. individuals, but you know, in our case, in in, in most instances, yes. we're dealing with yeah. with businesses or institutions of various types. And so, if you're if you're not just a natural person bringing a suit on your on your own behalf, but in fact, in house counsel for a, a company, well, this affects you. So and another question: yes. If you're in defense and you're a legal person, would you absolutely. 
Any, 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 Same. any, so any pleading. The, the so that could be a motion to institute proceedings. That could be a preliminary motion. That could be a defense. Yeah, but the, the, the first motion could be in French. If it is a natural person, then the defense. Yes, that's right. English, if you're a natural so person, you could do everything in English and it wouldn't be an issue. I mean, I work primarily in class actions and a lot of these class actions are brought in English. It typically will not affect them on, on the plaintiff side because they're representing typically a natural person who's the proposed class representative. But on the defense side, we're almost always a corporate entity and therefore we have to comply with this. The Another couple points. This does not relate to exhibits. It only relates to procedures. So that's helpful because that could be a, yeah, that was a catastrophe that we had from clients. Imagine that, the yeah. catastrophe if it applied to exhibits, it would almost be unthinkable. Uh, and, and it, oh my gosh, okay, I see that I've only got two minutes left, but this is the important point, so I don't mind uh, devoting attention to it. The other, the other thing is that it would not apply to an outline of argument, so to, uh, to written submissions that are not procedures. That's another important thing to keep in mind. So maybe the compromise with a client potentially is to say, well, look, we will draft the procedures in French, However, we will we will provide our written arguments and some of our uh, oral arguments in in English. And again, this is about procedures. It's not about oral representations. A uh, couple other quick points in terms of judgments. Judgments that are rendered, and again, the constitutional issue is, is an interesting one. Judgments that are rendered in English that are dispositive, that are a final judgment will have to be immediately and without delay, I'm quoting a, a little bit tautological, I think, uh, or will immediately and without delay have to also be uh, to attach a, um, a French translation. That's new. Um, if you are a party and the decision is rendered in French, you are entitled to an English translation. If you are anybody in the universe, and the decision is rendered in uh, in English, you are entitled to a French translation. And those costs are borne by the court system. Again, access to justice, resources, yeah. logistics, where are they going to find the, the personnel to do this? They already are very extremely short-staffed, as you may know. So that's that's a new thing. Foreign judgments, foreign arbitration decisions, if they're rendered in a, in a language other than the, the French language, they will have to be translated, certified, again, a certified translation. If you have an arbitration decision rendered in English, it will have to be translated into French, certified translation. I'm just gonna end with one point very, very quickly. As you can imagine, and I've, we've just touched upon it. We've just, we've just touched upon the complexity of this, of this legislation, but it's controversial. People are talking about to it. To say People the are, least. To say the least. <laughs> People are writing about it. Uh, and it is actively being challenged now. They're, right now in yes. court, there is a challenge that was brought by the English Montreal School Board. And this, what's interesting about the constitutional aspect is that this legislation invokes the notwithstanding clause, if you'll pardon my uh, imprecise use of that term, which is section 13 of uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The notwithstanding clause relates to various fundamental rights, including freedom of expression. However, the charter is not the entire constitution. The cons in addition to the Constitution Act 1982, there's also the good old British North America Act, as it used to be called, the Constitution Act 1867. And the Constitution Act 1867 contains provisions that deal among other things with language rights, I'm thinking most notably of, of uh, section 133. So can a serious constitutional challenge be mounted on the basis of pro language provisions outside of the Canadian Charter? That remains to be seen. On that very uncertain note, I will pass over the baton to my wonderful colleague. Thank you, sir. Uh, Maître Boyle, who is the head and the leader of our wonderful labor and employment group, and she will address uh, some other very salient issues. Just Nancy, before you start, yeah, I forgot ahead. to mention in my introduction that, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will have uh, tons of questions. Um, there's a, a little, little box in the, in the webinar, so 
pose your questions and we'll answer those we can answer. And, um, and, and uh, we'll have about half an hour at the end for, for those questions. So please, uh, uh, the more the better. Nancy, on to you. Thank you so much. So my type of law, employment and labor, deals with day-to-day -day matters because it touches everybody every day. So the language and how you're going to operate with your employees and the language of your documentation and how what is the impact of that is a day-to-day -day matter. So it's like I like to tell my clients, I am I'm with you every day, and we could see it now with the impact of this bill. So we'll start with, I'm going to have, there's a lot more things or ramification as we used uh, before that are there, but we're going to touch to four subjects. For here, the first one is the language of communication that will have the impacts with your employees. That's one of the biggest and I'd say muddier waters that we have in that piece of legislation and will impact a lot of employers who have head offices here and ones who don't have head offices here, but who have employees here in Quebec. That's going to be the language of contracts also, your employment contracts, and not only the employment contracts, but related documents. It could touch to everything that goes from your share option plans, your phantom stocks, name it. It's going to touch all of that. Also, the third point is the requirement of uh, the knowledge of another uh, language than French in order to fill a position. And that also affects existing positions, not only positions that you will be posting post, Jan post June 1st, 2022. And also the fourth part of it, which is that every company or corporation that has more than 25 employees uh, for a period of six months will have to register with the uh, Office de la Langue Française in order to obtain a francization certificate. It's used to be 50 employees in Quebec. Again, that's a question we get a lot is that we'll have more than 50 employees across Canada. It's 50 and it's 25 employees within the province of Quebec. And it does not include independent contractors, it includes only employees. So, and but that piece of legislation will be enacted only on June 1st, 2025. That's when Sean was really saying that there's stages. The other changes that I just mentioned are all in effect right now, as of June 1st, 2022. But that fourth point, it's only in June 2025. So you'll have to prepare for that. It gives you three years, but you have to prepare. So now let's go to the first point, which is the language of contract. Uh, not the language of contract, but language of communications. So basically what the bill says is that you have to communicate from now on only in French with your employees, unless they request that you communicate it with them in English. But you have to communicate with them in French before they ask you to communicate in English. So for, and this applies to emails, town halls, meetings, any communication. So you could see that that on a day-to-day -day basis, it might be difficult. We've all been there in a meeting where, you know, there's one Anglophone and there's five Francophone and everybody speaks English because we all speak English. But, you know, in theory, the meeting would have to be held in French and one of the person, the, uh, the Anglophone would have to to provide either translation for him or something. So you can see that this can become difficult. How will this be applied by the, the government or what I call them? I've been told that I can't say that, but anyway, I'll say it anyway. The French police, the, um, <laughs> it's gonna be hard to tell because you know, unless there's a complaint by one of your employees in a situation like that, there will likely be no intervention from the uh, from the government. However, a complaint is always possible. It has happened at a few of my clients before under bill under under bill 101. So it's and we deal with it. We try to uh, accommodate most people and try to come to to respect the language of, of their employees who wants to communicate. So that's the that's going to be the issue with the language of communication is going to be difficult. Where likely it's going to be more um, looked into by the, the, the government is when you tr you're going to be requesting the re renewal of your uh, francization certificate. Because when they do the renewal of your francization certificate, they look, they do an analysis of the a linguistic analysis that they call, and they look at everything. As some the people who have been going through that know, they'll look at uh, your 
proceedings, they'll look at your IT, you look at their, your commercial, they'll look at the, the computers, they'll look at everything. And that's probably where they'll see and they, they can spot check, they come into the business and they spot check and they talk to employees. Can you communicate in French? They even go to plants, uh, talk to employees on the floor. So they, that's likely the place where you'll have a problem and they'll say to you, well, you're going to have to generalize and even act up your, your French, the number of people speaking French. Some of my clients uh, just lay said, listen, I can't even hire someone who speaks English or French. So what do you think I'm going to do? Good question. I have no answer to that one, but it's a very good question. Language of contracts. Um, okay. So as I said, and uh, Sean touched base on that, language of contracts is uh, in French. It's always been like that, however, in the previous, uh, previous uh, version of, of uh, Law 101. However, now it's got teeth and a lot of teeth because if you don't respect it, you might be looking at your contract of employment and related documents be declared null and void, which is a big issue. And if the person who's been, you know, uh, who said, well, it should have been in French and wasn't, uh, doesn't want to have the contract noil, then they could have, they can seek damages for it. So I guess, Nancy, that would be problematic if you're seeking to uh, to uh, enforce a non-competition clause. Yeah. Uh, well, in Quebec, you could still enforce. No, but it was yeah. in English in the contract, yeah. and then it could be declared mm -hmm. null on. Everything would be null and void. So even mm -hmm. and if, it, for example, it was difficult. Uh, to start with. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult to start with, but in, in, in Quebec was probably uh, easier than other provinces. Well, as you know, Ontario for non-C-suite employees, you can't, you can't have an, uh, a non-compete anymore, but in Quebec, it's still possible. But all your non-compete, your non-solicitation clauses would be null and void. So you could see that an employee who's looking to annul the contract when he's leaving could, could actually try to do that. So, and... However, the law per se, Article 41 says that your employment contract and your related documents can be in another language if it's requested by the employees. Remember that in the old days, we used to put a clause that says this contract, the parties have requested that this contract be drafted in the English language and with the French. Huh? Uh, that's, uh, I, some people will try to do that. If the contract of employment is negotiated, a, a different version of that clause will be acceptable if it's signed before. And if you send the contract to the employee in English before, uh, then you've covered all your bases. But it will be possible to sign an employment contract in English if it's negotiated between the parties. It's not a, co a contract of adhesion. And then, or if it's in a contract of adhesion, you've sent the French version before and the employee has requested and you need to keep this as evidence, as requested that it, is, it be bound by the English version of the contract. That will be possible. And that works for every type of related employment document. Nancy, I would suggest we put the French version annexed to the English version. So it's sure that they yes. saw it. Yes, actually what we've looked into and uh, because I've, done, I've worked in uh, for expat contracts in other countries and I've seen in this, a lot of countries where they, where they have a similar actually, and we're not the precursors of this by any means, is that where we've seen where you have a side by side, you have your French version, you have your English version on the same same uh, document and and then you you so you and so this way the, the employee cannot say well i requested it in french and i never got it so it's on the same document so the e proof becomes evidence becomes easier so that's probably one of the avenues that we're going to go to but that means that you have your similar translation so one so, of the things so that will be a lot of work for, for lawyers and translators and then uh, translator so, yeah. especially if the and, and as sean said the french version is going to be the one that's going to have uh, uh, that's going to be predominant for the court that's going to be the one that's enforceable so you have to make sure that your translation of the english if it comes from one of your clients from outside of quebec is really accurate and and, and really is, uh, I would say, reflects the intentions of the parties. So that's for the language of, of documents. Um, if you look at, that's uh, that I've covered, sorry. Now, the, four, the third point, requirements of another language for, another, for a, a position. 
Another language in French for a position. That's probably with the contracts and uh, the biggest part of or the biggest portion or hindrance for an employer, I would say. Uh, so the, there's criteria here, and I, I will tell them, and uh, you could always look them up on, in the law. So the, the employer will have to uh, make sure and be able to evade to actually make evidence of this, demonstrate, the, the law used the words demonstrate, evaluate the needs for another language with respect to the, uh, to the duties to be accomplished. Not only the position, but to do duties. So you have to look at all duties and, and separate the duties where you will need the English requirement or another language in English for, uh, for, the, for the position to be accomplished. Then after that, the, and that's the, 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 the real ticker for me, is that, that the knowledge of the other members of the team of the, or the other employees is insufficient in order to fulfill those duties. So you have to look at in similar position in, in the, or the same position, the member of the team. Oh, could this guy do it since this guy cannot do it? And then I'll be able to, I won't be able to request another language. That for me is like, how are you going to apply that? But anyway, it's in there. <laughs> and then after that, you have limiting the number of position uh, while you were, you, that you request, you request another language than French. Again, that's another difficulty, and it comes right to your ability to serve your clients. But I think there's going to be, given that the global market and that most of our employers here actually do business in the rest of Canada and in other or global, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to, do, to say what's going to happen with that. With this type of sanction, an employee who did not get the position or an employee who's being told that his English is not to, up to par or enough for the, uh, the position, who was hired saying that, oh, yes, I speak French, I, I speak English, I speak another language that I need. And then after that, he's, he's reprimanded for that, which is also not, uh, also pre, not uh, pre, it's, how could I say this? It's more than front upon this is actually you have you cannot request that or if you do they can file a complaint at the labor standards commission and uh, the question here is that will they get a lawyer for free like everything else that it's not not clear right, right now but it's most likely and uh, so and then and after that and of course there's the penalties that uh, we talked about uh, earlier with Sean on that point so and that brings me to the last point, which is the, uh, and I won't go into that because it's too much because it's only in three years, but for the, the section where the 25, it's lowered down the criteria to the 25 employees in Quebec. And once you've registered with the government, you have, the, you have to do to fill the linguistic analysis. When they do the linguistic analysis, they have a right to investigate. And if they, if they find that you know, you're, you're respecting the law, they will issue your francization certificate. So that's the basic issue with this one. So in conclusion, uh, what I would recommend to employers who are doing business in Quebec is review their hiring process and their language of another language than French uh, start right away. Uh, right now, as, as we mentioned to some of our employees, the bureaucracy is not up to par with the law. So there's, it's very doubtful that they'll come knocking on your door unless you need to renew your French certificate. But still, I would start rather sooner than, than later. And uh, so review your, your hiring process. Make sure your templates are up to date for French and English uh, contracts. Uh, think about the use of the side-by-side and uh, make sure you communicate with your employees in French first and that uh, you, you take that and you have a process for that. You just, you just can't wing it, I think. You just make sure that you install a process and work with your HR departments in order to spearhead that project. I think that's gonna be a great, uh, a great solution. Communicate with your employees, as I said, in French and provide them with their employment doc related documents in French first. And, uh, and I, we mentioned the use of the side-by-side. -side. Translate their employment uh, contracts into French if they are adhesion contract and not negotiated. 
remember that most employment contract in Quebec are viewed as adhesion contract unless you're into a transaction and there's some negotiation of key employee contracts. They're usually viewed as uh, contracts of adhesion or contracts where we say conditions are imposed by the employer. And add a clause acknowledging that the, fr the French contract has been provided to the employee and that the employee has requested be bond by the English version. Another point which of interest is that this will apply to federally regulated employers. Like uh, we have a few here in, uh, in like the Port of Montreal, uh, anything that has to do with transport, banks, banks et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be, that's probably going to be a, you know, one of the challenges that we expect from the federal government, because, you know, even though with the non-withstanding clause, if that's still not within the jurisdiction of the Parliament of, of Quebec, that to impose conditions on uh, employers that are jurisdictionally regulated for employment matters, I'm talking, uh, by the Canada Labor Code. So that's one of that we're expecting as not to my knowledge, that has not been filed yet, but that's one I would be expecting. Thank you very much for your time. Monsieur Gilles Seguin. Hi. So I'm the uh, a corporate lawyer, quiet lawyer here. We have <laughs> and if so you sorry. believe that. <laughs> so sorry if it is a bit boring. <laughs> I, I have my text here. So uh, today I'll talk about the new Bill 96 and how it impacts the language of commerce and uh, business. I uh, will mainly talk about the contracts with the Quebec Civil Administration and the contracts between parties. I will also talk about miscellaneous modifications to the Charter of the French language that affect the commerce and the, the business. So. Uh, the Charter of the French language defines the civil administration as the Quebec government, governmental agencies, crown corporation, and municipalities. Basically, it's any corporation that is owned by the Quebec government. It includes Hydro-Québec, Investment Québec, Loto Québec, SAQ, etc., etc., etc. So the basic rule remains the same. Subject to certain exception, any contract with the civil administration must be in French. The exceptions include contracts that are signed outside Quebec. So I've seen in my practice, like Investment Quebec or CDPQ, uh, going to Toronto or New York only to sign a contract in order to comply with the, the requirements uh, of the act. Certain financial contracts- You mean circumvent? The yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, certain financial contracts like loan agreements, financial instruments, international agreements, agreements with the First Nations. So what happened is that was not in the, the first version of the Bill 96, that, is, uh, that uh, exception, is that, of course, when the Quebec government is uh, preparing or having financial instruments. They, they come from New York, from Toronto. They are in English. They could be like uh, 100 pages. So it, and it, the, the text is so difficult, it would be almost impossible to translate. And, uh, and in any case, nobody will give an opinion on that. So, so it's why they say that. The money, since we need the money, uh, we can as well have <laughs> simply the language of the of the lender uh, on those agreements. It includes also contracts with individuals not residing in Quebec, of course. Finally, it includes contracts with legal persons with limited presence in Quebec, having but they have to have their head office outside Quebec. Mm. Any application for a permit, grant, authorization, or financial assistance made by a legal person, so okay. we have a, yeah, that... uh, the, the distinction, must be made in French, including all the documents that are related to uh, that uh, request. So it could be a lease, it could be anything that is, uh, it has to be translated. There are exceptions also to that rule. Those exceptions are application for loans and financial instruments. Once again, we have the 
the concept that loans are not covered by that, uh, that general rule. I have a question. Yes. When you talk I about have an answer. <laughs> when you talk about financial documents, could we include in that, uh, for example, for employees, uh, stock option plans? Do you, what would be your your take on this? I know it's not a, an official yes. answer because we have no answers on that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. First of all. Everything we see is new. We don't have jurisprudence. Yeah, we exactly. don't have uh, yeah. anything or even doctrine on this. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. No. Uh, it's it's really the financial instruments would be like derivatives, uh, options, complex uh, dealing with the market, uh, management of risk, risk management documents. It's so not really the, not the, really that uh, type of document. Okay. I really believe they have to be translated also. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, um, okay. uh, the second topic, sorry, thank you, thank you, Nancy. <laughs> the second topic I wish to address is the language of the contracts between private parties. This is very interesting. If the contract between the parties is an adhesion contract, the party submitting the contract must provide first the French language <laughs> contract. This is the big difference because in the past, we simply have to add that French English clause in the English contract, we sign and that's it. This is no longer valid. You have to give the French language contract first yeah. and then the person will have the right to uh, sign that French contract or the right to request the English version of the contract. And then you could then provide the uh, and then uh, decide which contract well, they want to uh, be bound yeah, by. Yeah, but it's really the person receiving the adhesion contract. Yeah. That Gilles, Gilles, I think I'll correct you. You said the right to receive the contract in English. I don't think that's that, a right. It's, uh, it's a yeah. privilege, maybe. Uh, businesses aren't bound to provide an English version if requested, right? Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Of course. Um, the, the question is, what is an adhesion contract? Uh, it's not so simple. An adhesion contract is a contract whose main clauses have been stipulated by one party and cannot be negotiated. That's the general rule. But it is sometimes difficult to determine what is an adhesion contract. The Office de la Langue Française gave us examples of adhesion contracts. It considers insurance contracts. Are we, are we talk, going to talk about insurance contracts? No, no, not me. No, no. no, 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 no. This is another topic. <laughs> Leases and co-ownership declarations as adhesion contract. Uh, there is the, the question of, yeah, uh, that's fine. But um, now we have contracts, well, our, what we call regular contracts that we negotiate between uh, commercial lawyers. They contain usually massive standard clauses. At the end. At the end, <laughs> at the end or in the, the corpus, also with loan agreements. And so do we have to give a French version of that? Uh, my take is uh, no. If it is a commercial negotiated contract, even if it contains 90% of standard clauses, it is commercially negotiated. It's not an adhesion contract. Hmm. But really, uh, from now on, what I'll do is uh, I will obtain a mail from the parties saying that in, before uh, starting the, the negotiation, a mail from the parties saying that they agree that the contract be in English. Mm -hmm. oh, that's the, a good point. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the contract, the question is also, well, it's not an adhesion contract, so we don't have to do uh, to, to put the, the, the famous French English clause. So, so, are we going to put the, the, the clause itself? I'll put it, uh, mm -hmm. frankly, uh, because it's always, you know, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm afraid of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's about the same. Good <laughs> point. <laughs> je, je, well, maybe. Well, Oh, sorry, yeah, me no, please. And please. this is maybe a very, very please. stupid comment, but in, in in the actual contract itself, would there actually be a stipulation to the effect that the parties agree that this was negotiated and is not? I would, I would put it. Yeah, I'll, just to a little I, bit I think more, everybody uh, will put it anyway. Yeah. Anyway. I, and and I it's would not probably because you put this. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, of course. That's okay. Yeah. It's uh, an evidence that it is an adhesion contract. It's simply, I will put it anyway. Mm. 
And so also, I would answer. probably use the word "requested" and now instead of uh, "agreed" because the because of the change mm -hmm. of, of yeah. the uh, wording in the law. Yeah. And I would have like a special signature for that clause, especially if it's in a long agreement, so the person can say, "Well, I didn't see the clause." Just for a little initial by by the yeah, clause. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bill 96 also mentions that adhesion contract used in relations outside Quebec may be drawn up in English. Uh, I read a lot of doctrines on that, and I really don't know what it means. Contract used in relation outside Quebec. Uh, does it mean that the person receiving the contract, uh, if he's outside Quebec, you don't have to translate the contract? if you have your head office and everything, your activities in, in Quebec? Or does it mean that any person receiving the contract here from uh, an entity that, uh, that is outside Quebec, with head office outside Quebec, um, uh, could receive the, the contract in English? Uh, that, I, I don't think so, but it's really not clear and th there are no answer to that. We'll have to, to wait for the, the doctrine. Uh, I'd like to also uh, mention a few changes affecting businesses. So businesses that offer goods and services in Quebec must inform and serve their client consumer and non-consumer in French. The, the big difference, we had that in the, the previous act, in the previous version of the act at the Charter of the French Language, but now it is extended to non-consumer. So it could be to commercial party, B2B. Uh, and there are offers, offers uh, like sanctions that are attached to that. Another point, very important, most of the registration filings must be made exclusively in French. For instance, the filing with the uh, land register or the register of personal and movable real rights. The description of assets covered by the hypothèque must be in French. That was a between practitioners. Uh, that was a that will be a problem because most of the uh, the, the other jurisdiction will have. For instance, if you have a multinational deal with uh, uh, securities that are taken in, in Canada and the States uh, elsewhere, so you have a strict definition of the assets that are covered by. The, uh, the hypothèque, the mortgage. Uh, so you will have to translate it to French and then file. And of course, with the translation, you know, the movie Lost in Translation. So yeah, it, you double the, the, and, the yeah, possibilities yeah, of, an, exactly. of an error. <laughs> uh, and when you're talking a billion dollars, uh, <laughs> it's, it's different. Catalogs, brochures, and pamphlets must be available in French. Um, the fact that if they are not available in French, you have to withdraw the English version uh, wherever you go. Uh, and finally, and finally, uh, all real estate transactions for residential building of less than five dwellings must be drawn up in, in French, except if all the parties request. So I, I, don't, I really don't know what's the, the relevance of that. Yeah. It's Thing, difficult but, to, but, I, but if the part I know you yeah. said finally, but I have one more to add yes. that, you know, that, and that, that touches employment, uh, particularly, but all communications from the government, let's say coming, coming from the, the commission, coming from the workers comp, coming from uh, the health tax or anything that our clients who have do not have head offices in Quebec are receiving will all now be purely in French. It was already the case for some, but now it's clear in the law that the Quebec government mm -hmm. and its related entities will only communicate with businesses in French. So make sure that you have a French speaking person receiving your documentation because this has happened to clients of mine where they got it, the person didn't know what it was, filed it somewhere else, and then we had to make you know, uh, re motions for review because we didn't receive it. It was lost somewhere, not even in translation. And it was is just a, a, a real big problem. So just make sure that from now on, that the person receiving your documentation, oh. Oh, what? Oh, oh. oh. Uh. that the person receiving your documentation at your head office uh, outside of Quebec is a French speaking person and have a backup when they're on vacation, 
I, I'm, I'm talking really practical points here, but this is things that we actually live through. So, Thank I, you. so I know you said final, but there was that one. <laughs> Stay it over until it's over. Exactly. <laughs> So is it my turn? Yes. yes, it is. So I'll be talking about the use of trademarks in um, uh, product labeling and uh, public signage. Uh, we might run over a little bit over there. So we'll, we'll, we may cut a bit into the question time, but this is important, I think. Um, that must be Sean's fault. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. He was, uh, we, we did it in French yesterday. <laughs> it's always and, my and, fault. Uh, the, the, the person that did Sean's bit yesterday was a lot briefer. <laughs> but Sean they is complain, always, but, but they but, asked me to do it anyway. But, not yeah, as entertaining. but Sean is always very, very interesting. Well, we, we invited the rock star. Oh, yeah. so, exactly. we'll... <laughs> um, so, so, so the modifications that, that touch trademarks aren't very numerous, but I would qualify them as major. Um, I was instructed when we were preparing this not to scare people or be alarmist, so I will stop now and move mm -hmm. to questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so, so before looking at what the changes are, I think it's important to see what the exceptions uh, uh, that currently exist and, and how mm -hmm. complex they already are, because we will be adding a, a level of complexity and 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 especially uh, of uncertainty. Now, these changes don't come into effect for, for three years, not until June 1st, 2025. So people think, okay, good, we have time. But honestly, we don't know how much time we have because the regulation um, for respecting the language of commerce and business that provides the exceptions and defines uh, certain concepts is not even in... in a, you know, it's not even published. I don't even know if they started working on it. So, so that's where um, there are problems. Um, now, generally speaking, uh, the charter as it currently exists imposes the use of French on products, on labels, on, on uh, packaging, public signage, so f storefront signage. Um, and, and there's an, a very important exception, except if it's a trademark recognized under the Trademarks Act, which is a federal statute, unless a French version has been registered. So tip number one, if you have two versions, a French and an English version of trademark, we quite often recommend only filing the English one, because if you, if you register the French one, then, then you lose the right to that exception. And, and that, that, that remains. So... Um, so filing the English one or the German one or the Japanese one, you know, we always talk about English, but but mm -hmm. technically the statute doesn't discriminate one language mm -hmm. over True. the other. They're all discriminated, um, except for French. Equally. Equally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so so currently, as I said, the, the exception is, is a, a trademark that is in a language other than French uh, that's recognized as a trademark. Now, recognized as a trademark, had some interpretation, the uh, Office Québécois de la langue française, as Nancy would not uh, properly uh, name them, uh, quite often took the, the position that it, it meant a registered trademark. So quite often when we, a client would get a complaint, we'd look at it, we'd file a trademark application, send it over to the OQLF, and they say, okay, it's, an app, it's applied for, and then they'd close their file and, and, and move on. Um, and, and when it did go to court, even if you didn't have a registered trademark or an applied for a registration trademark, then the courts usually recognize that uh, uh, it, it was a trademark because the definition of a trademark in the Trademarks Act is, is, is it has nothing to do with it, it being registered or not. The registrability is, is another criteria. So, so that was fairly safe. Um, and, but that will change. But before we get into the, the, the change, I think it's important that we ask ourselves a question, well, what is a trademark in a language other than French? I mean, it's really easy if, if you're talking about a contract. Is a contract in French or is a contract in English? But for a trademark, when it's one word or two words, um, there may be some ambiguity. So, of course, if your trademark is entirely in French, like the Cirque du Soleil, well, then you don't need to even think about it because it's a French trademark. And then, then you have words that could be uh, a word in French and in another language, like celebration, forest, there's so many uh, words that, that so th that, that could be a good idea if you're choosing a trademark to, to, to use a, a, a term that's bilingual. Uh, I think that's fairly safe. And then there are words that 
are originally not in French, but became recognized in, 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 in French. And I remember I had a file a few years ago for uh, the Scores restaurant chain, and they asked if they had to add some French you know, description on, on, on its storefront signage, because uh, you know people call it Scores, even most Francophones. But then I looked in the dictionary, and then a scorey is, is, is a verb, and a scar, yes. It, so, so it got implemented into the French language. So we took the position that it, it, it's a French, it's a French word now. So, so that that works too. Um, so you would say that recognized Anglicism that are now in the French dictionary could be could be French. Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, La Rousse <laughs> or the Petit Rabat put it in there, I think it's a pretty good argument. It's, good, that, uh, that's, it's, a good it's, argument. it's, a, it's a, not in a language other than French. But but then again, it is in a language other than French, although it is in French. So so there's room there for mm. for debate. Um, and now there are, there are obviously uh, other trademarks that are purely invented words, like I'm um, thinking of Kodak. Google, for instance, th those aren't words in any language. So then you don't need to ask yourself mm. the question, do I fall within the exception or not? Mm. But then again, I've seen cases where you think it's, it's, uh, it's a word in another language. You think it's not a word in another language. It's not a word in French. It's not a word in English. It's not a word in Spanish. Oh, but it's a word in Irish Gaelic. Or it's a word in ancient Babylonian. And these are real cases. I, I, so we have to ask ourselves the question. I mean... Are linguists going to be hired to determine whether it's a word in another language? Or will the criteria be a little looser in the sense that if the public doesn't perceive it as a word in another language, so this is, but this, this is already there. And, and, um, and then there's our acronyms. Our acronyms words in a language other than French, like IBM, for instance, which is International Business Machine. I don't think IBM would be recognized as a word, although it's an acronym for an English term. However, if you use an acronym that's known for an English expression, such as ASAP, for as soon as possible, then I would take the position that it's probably mm. a word in a language other than French. Mm. And then, of course, you have all the uh, major brands like Apple, Canadian Tire, Burger King, which clearly are... Uh, are not arguably uh, in French. So, so then they... Um, They need to have, a, well, they can use it if it's a trademark. But now, or yes, but now it has to be registered. Well, not now, in three years. So that, that's, that's the major change. To benefit from the exception, your trademark needs to be registered, which in itself raises a lot of other problems. For instance, as uh, some of you might know, it takes at least two to three years in the best cases to get a trademark registration. Um, if, there's a, if there are op uh, objections, if there are oppositions, if the oppositions are appealed to the federal court, then to the federal court of appeal, and potentially to the Supreme Court, it happens. It could take 10 to 15 years to get a trademark registration. So what happens in the meantime? Do you put your business on hold? Do you just wait until you, know, you go bankrupt uh, and not, not do business at all? Um, And another issue. So you would say that businesses right now were using a trademark that is recognized as a trademark, yeah. but not registered. Exactly. So they hurry up and and file for the yeah, registration. Of course. I mean that, that, that that's the first um, that that's the first recommendation would be just just in case file as soon as possible all, all trademarks uh, that you you're using or that you plan on using. And the other problem is that. Trademark registrations don't, don't cover everything under the sun. They, they cover a, a strict list of, of goods and services. Now, if, if, if I'm selling pencils and I have a trademark registration that covers pencils and I decide to extend my business to, to, to pens or erasers, but they're not covered in my registration, will the, applica uh, will, will the exception apply? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't sleep at night. I mean, I'm, I'm really, really baffled by this. So, so th these are... are um, major issues that, that so, so, so we're waiting for the regulation. What will the exceptions be? Um, because uh, the, the, the regulations already provide for numerous exceptions, for example, cultural products, tires, uh, things that are embossed or engraved. That's why like most uh, appliances and automobiles, everything's in English because the, the way they're, the right, you know, the inscriptions are, are made on the product, then they fall within the exception. Um, But then there's an exception to the exception. If your registered trademark contains generic language, then the generic language needs to be translated into French. Now, the 
original purpose for this is that that some people or businesses to 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 get around the the um, uh, the to 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 be able to uh, apply the exception of the use of a reg of a trademark would file an application to register the whole label as a trademark and the whole label would be in English or in Spanish or whatever. And then, and they'd get a registration for a label and then they'd go to the OQLF and say, listen, I have a trademark registration for the label. So, so I, I'm good. But then the, um, so, so now if, if there's generic language, you would nevertheless need to, uh, to translate it, which raises a constitutional question because the federal trademarks act provides you grants you a positive right to use a registered trademark uh from 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 one ocean to the other now so, so pascal if we have uh, like beyond meat uh the food yeah uh, the food uh, locker so, so what will happen well that, that's a good question what i think if if well beyond meat meat is a, is a generic but beyond is not so what beyond beyond we'd need to yeah, i don't yeah, know yeah. it's it's and, and, and i mean i could understand and it makes sense if 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 we're just trying to avoid being able to circumvent the whole labeling uh, provisions by, by, by imposing the translation of the generic uh, parts. But, but she had raised a good question. And, and, and we often see in trademarks, you have the, the, the distinctive part of the trademark and underneath it, you would have like clothing or footwear. Like, so what, 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 what would happen? I mean, so- And there's... isn't it true that the description now has to be Pre uh, predominant in French. So if you have home hardware, you have to write sans de quincaillerie in yeah. French, and that has to be twice as big as the other right. one. Right. I'm getting into that. That's a oh, public sorry. signage. We're just going to touch on it very soon. Okay. So just closing up on, on the, um, the, the the trademarks on, on, on the, the product issue. So if you need to translate the generic term in a registered trademark, and let's say your 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 shirts or your, your footwear uh, is... is are, are you know made in China? Will, will they need to put in a, a just a separate line just for for the tiny Quebec market, uh, or will businesses simply say, well, no, we won't go to Quebec; it's too mm. complicated? Or will this be part of the exception of the one of the numerous exceptions mm. we're waiting for? We don't know. Now, going to signage, there's a similar uh, exception you could use a a, a a a trademark. And currently, what happened is is uh, a few years ago, the government uh, passed a new regulation stating that if your trademark is in a language other than French, then you you, you need to have some, um, uh, just to use the exact term, hold on, the exact term is... Uh, uh, I think it was description, is that? Well, yeah, you need to have some uh, a certain level of French uh, must be... Uh, sufficient, a sufficient presence of French, and then the regulation defines what sufficient is. So, so there's a some a somewhat of a balance. So that's why you you, you start you started seeing Toys R Us jouet, uh, second cup café et compagnie, uh, les magasins home hardware. So, so th th that's not a big deal. Um, but now with the new act and and the 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 French will need if you're using a, 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 a trademark other in a language other than French on your on your storefront signage, then French has to be markedly predominant, which means that it's much bigger. That's that's why uh, how yeah, I understand but I, it. That's, but I've heard some people say that it's going to be twice as big. That's what that, that, that's, that, there are rumors to that effect. Those are rumors. So yes. uh, I've got two minutes. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking, for example, we talked about Canadian Tire. You, you've all seen how big Canadian Tire, um, uh, uh, how, how much place it takes up on the storefront it takes the entire building so what will happen will they grow smaller uh will they um put a neck a top sign on top of the building saying les magasins really big you know i don't know and 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 another question is is will will, will companies uh you know um that don't have a registered trademark that are expanding into into uh canada uh, or Canadian businesses that want to go into Quebec, will they boycott Quebec? I mean, that, that's that's something that could possibly happen to a certain extent. I mean, we see it, for example, in, in publicity contests where, where Quebec has particularly uh, heavier or more onerous rules, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, 
for, for publicity contests. So quite often you have like a, a contest and, and it says for Canadian residents, except Quebec, because it's just too complicated. But then again, I, I just want to make sure that, that it's not the end of the world if you need to have a, a, a French trademark in Quebec. A lot of businesses have done it voluntarily. I'm thinking of, of Poulet Free Kentucky, which is Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, Business Depot is Bureau en Gros in Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, Shoppers Drug Mart is Pharmaprix. Because there's also, notwithstanding the law, there's also, well, the, the commercial uh, aspect. You want to sell things. So if you want to appeal to Quebec residents, um, having your signage in French is, is, is a good recommendation. Uh, so so that's uh, spilling over by five minutes. Um, kind of covers, I guess, what are the most important, or what we feel are the most important aspects of, of this new piece of legislation. Of course, for other businesses, there may be things we haven't discussed that are important. So, um, so for, for that's why we're having questions now, and, and, and uh, we're always open for questions later on. So I will read the questions and then see to dispatch them to whomever I think is the, the best fit to answer them. So the first question, if the software we use to create invoices for clients, non-consumers across Canada is only provided in English, then I'll just make a little parenthesis here. There's an exception for software. Yes. Software has to be provided to employees in French unless it doesn't exist. Because sometimes there's very, very specialized software and it just doesn't exist. So, so not as to not impede business too much, it's a lot. But for example, I'll, I'll, everything that's Word, Office. Yeah, you know, that was uh, recognized as a uh, exception before, and they continue yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. It. So, so I'm just uh, making that a little parenthesis. So, anyway, so if the software we use to create invoices for clients, non consumers across Canada, is only provided in English, can we continue to use the software, or will we have to change the software we use? Aha, then, then as I said, if it exists in French, well, that's already the case. If we need to change the software to provide invoices in French, for client for Quebec clients, do we have three years as part of the francization process? Uh, we are more than 25 employees and less than 50 employees, or do we have to be changed now? Uh, Nancy? Well, for the employee part, if it's part of the francization, it's in three years. <coughs> However, I, for the commercial part, Jill, I think the fact that you have to provide invoices in French is already applicable. It's all, yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's already applicable. So if the software is in English, uh, you don't need to translate the software, but you would need to have a, a module implemented to have the the, the, the invoices printed out yeah. or issued out in French. That's that's. Yeah, you would have to be able to generate your invoices in French. Yeah. Next question: uh, With the changes in job postings, oh, uh, that smells like a Nancy question. Yes. <laughs> I can read it. <laughs> with, with the, the changes in job posting uh, comes. Uh, from Diana, with the changes in job posting, am I how am I to recruit talent when company deals with Canada and U.S. and only 30% of our business in Quebec? I need bilingual employees and some work outside of Quebec and only speak English. That's actually what I was talking about earlier, some comments from some of my clients. I think the most important thing for you is to be able to recruit and still, uh, you know, look into uh, get into applying or complying with the law as much as possible but you will have to deal this it's going to be a difficult balance but the most important thing will be to run your business and if you're able to it's 30 percent of your uh, only in quebec then you'll be able to uh, fill the requirements about how to uh, how to establish the knowledge of english for for your positions um, and maybe before we move on to the next question, because uh, I'm sure a lot of people ha have that question. We, we talked about it earlier about fines. Yes, there are fines. Yes. And that's that's what we need to think about. And they range from $700 minimal for a natural person. So that would be like a little mom and pop shop that's not necessarily incorporated up to $10,000, $30,000 for, for a, a, a company, an incorporated entity. And, and that doubles for a second offense and triples for any subsequent offense. And, and what's particularly um, potentially alarming is that they create a new category in the middle between natural persons and, 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 and companies are administrators and directors who can be personally fined some like in in the midway in the mid range on uh, uh, for, for, for offenses. I'd like to raise a very important yeah. point there is that 
we have sanctions and fines already in the charter yep. of the French language. Yes. And uh, I just saw some type of survey uh, about uh, that was produced by the uh, Office de la Langue Française. It is really, really a very, very small percentage of uh, fines that are given. Yes. Usually, you receive letters from the Office de la Langue yes. Française, you negotiate with them. You really have to be bad and yes. not answering them, neglecting them yes. to, to have the sanction. It's like yeah. a client. Exactly. You that, that's, the client. Yeah. Usually that's been my experience also. I don't want no. to no, 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 exactly. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that was <laughs> what I was uh, going to, to say. Yeah. So so in practice, it's scary. I mean, in theory, it's, pra it, it's scary, but in practice, it isn't. The, the, the people at the Office of Québécois de la Langue Française are helpful. They want to bring businesses to be compliant. They're willing to give reasonable deadlines and, and to do so. I had a case once. So far, it was the case. So, so far, far, yeah. And we hope it stays the way the same. I had a case where where um, it was a U.S. company selling products into Canada, and some of them were were just English, uh, purely English language labeled. Others were European labels with five languages, which could be good, but except that the English was bigger, and then the Spanish, German, French, and Italian were smaller. They'd have to all to be five the, the same, but then they had to be reprinted in China, and they gave us a year to do so. So, so it wasn't, you know, and everybody was happy. So next question, can parties to a contract agree to binding arbitration in English only? I guess, I guess, I guess I'll take that one. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting because um, that's very typical. There's a heck of a lot of uh, arbitrations that take place in English and that will continue to take place in English. Uh, however, as I, as I mentioned in my, uh, in my overly long <laughs> presentation, uh, the, the decision it, that's rendered in English will have to be translated into French, which raises an interesting issue because, of course, arbitration is highly confidential. So how would the state, the, commi yeah. the commissioner know? Will he, because he has powers or he or she, powers of inquiry and examination. So will they be able, will that commissioner be able to poke its, his or her nose into these confidential matters to make sure that uh, that the arbitration decision was was rendered uh, was also like translated before, into French. Unless there's a complaint, there's yeah, not going to be an issue. Or you're looking but, to have it homologated, then it, yes. It, yes, then that would become yes. an issue. And also keeping in mind, of course, that you know, as officers of the court, the lawyers are going to uh, going to encourage everyone to comply with the law. And quite often, the arbitrators themselves are either former judges or, mm -hmm. of course, lawyers. So so I'm sure that this will be respected, but it. Yes, you're right. It would like in the case of a homologation, then clearly you would need to produce both. But otherwise, uh, but yes. So, yes. Can it happen in English? Yes. Uh, but the decision would have to be translated into French. Just one other little comment that's completely unrelated to that excellent question by Gino. Yeah, we're our partner Gino. Hi, Gino. Hey, Gino. Uh, which, which is that, you know, before I was, I was talking about, you know, the two versions of the legislation and now the the court is going to have to favor uh, the the one that's in French, if there's a discrepancy, that's true, uh, except in the consumer setting, because the consumer can invoke the version that is most beneficial to him or yeah. her. Correct. Yeah. Just wanted to yeah. mention yeah, true, that. True. Sorry about uh, that. But just before going on, moving on to the next question, that that the, the question Gino just posed is interesting because let's say you say um, the, the 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 contract says the parties will arbitrate in <coughs> English and apply the code of civil procedure. Which provides that you have to file your your stuff in French. Yeah. Now, what happens is there? Is, did, did you waive that right, or or it, it's it becomes a, you know there anyway? So so very good question. No answer. <laughs> Next question: What are the implications for staff members? Oh, another Nancy question. Uh, who are not bilingual in terms of growth? Can we be exposed to discrimination down the road? Our managers are bilingual because their bosses or even their executives, et cetera, are in Brampton and only speak English. Annual management meetings are held in Brampton by the executive team are held in English. So the act provides, the new bill provides that, of course, there is a specific and that they cannot be uh, discriminated in any way. So if the fact that you're solely speaking a French speaker and you feel that you have been uh, discriminated, you'll have recourses. Uh, yeah, and, and I don't think the act imposes, um, or the, 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 I don't think it touches on verbal one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions, does it? It could, yeah, it could, actually, okay. it could, yeah. Um, next question, another, uh, oh, no, wait, uh, okay, for our yearly review, 
for our yearly performance reviews, if an employee is in Montreal and her manager is in Toronto, is this problematic? If the manager's comments are in English, what about if the manager asks for the employee's comments to be in English as well? Hmm. According to the act, all of that has to be in French now. Yes. Unless and the employee requests that it be in English. Right. And, 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 and then again, we're, we're, there's the law and then there's the application of the law. How far will the OQLF try to go outside of the province? That, that's a very good practical question. Yeah, but the, the jurisdiction issue is that, you know, there's no extraterritoriality. Yeah. So the head office is in Toronto, but you have employees in, here in Quebec. You still, uh, for your employees in Quebec, you still have to respect so they, the... Uh, they would be in a position of yeah. complaining. Uh, and, and So they would yeah. be in a position to complain to the labor uh, so right. standards. So if you have employees in Quebec... It's what the rules that I talked about that apply. Okay. Because I'm thinking, for instance, I, I, I get this question quite often. Uh, my, my business is, is in Ontario or it's in New York or whatever, and I have a website and I'm targeting Quebec consumers. Do I need to have a website in English? Now, the, the answer to that is in theory, yes. But in practice, the, the office uh, usually just, you know, uh, incites businesses to translate their, uh, their websites, but has not yet... Uh, from what I've seen, I've ever attempted to find a foreign, by foreign, I mean out of Quebec company for having a non-French website, parentheses. Okay, next question. What about old contracts of employment? Do we need to translate them? There is actually a provision in the new bill that says that you have a one year or two in order to request your contract in French if you want. So so you don't have to, the employee doesn't need to be proactive. It's only if the employee asks for it. That's it. Okay. It's only in the, if the employee asks for it. Uh, this is more of a Pascal question. What about social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera? Uh, well, I, I guess it would depend on what it touches. If, if it's, uh, I guess, uh, uh, some businesses communicate with their employees via uh, uh, social media, so that then I guess what, what Nancy said would apply. Uh, if it's a if it's a more of a commercial um, a c- commercial context, we, we, you know where where these platforms are used to promote the business, advertise uh, goods and services, then in theory, yes. If the company is in Quebec, definitely, because otherwise the QLF will have a jurisdiction over this. Otherwise, as I mentioned, there's a more uh, uh, incentive approach than a, a, a finding uh, approach to foreign mm-hmm. businesses. But uh, usually what it's not viewed necessarily if you look at what's been targeted on on facebook uh, instagram or uh, linkedin mostly it's targeted what from what i see it's not solely targeted to employees so it could definitely be right. you know most of the people now put it in french and english uh, i see it all the time and if it's not targeted to employees like a, a facebook for employees people have that apart from the facebook for employees targeted for quebec then you could have it in English. There's no issues there. Yeah, and, and I'm personally, I have a very interesting question uh, exactly on that. I'm, I'm dealing with, of course, uh, the use of social media by by person, by people that you know post a picture of their cat or their daughter's <laughs> birthday cake and whatever. That that could be in any language. It doesn't apply to that. But however, if and this this is the question. Sean and I are very happy that we will yeah. be able to post things about our dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but the issue then uh, arises when they're influencers, influencers who get benefits from promoting brands. Uh, does this become a commercial uh, posting? I would tend to say yes. So uh, so it falls in the gray area, but I would say more black mm. than, than white. Uh, next question, financial statements for a company having its head office in another province, but having an office in Quebec are all in English. May this be inserted in the French website in English? Let me take that one. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Most likely it's a public company. No, uh, Nobody in his right mind would put the... Uh, is a financial statement of a private company on a, on a website. So it's a public company. And the, the rule, the securities rule, is that continuous disclosure does not, have, does not have to be translated into French unless it is used as part or integrated by reference to a prospectus, to a short-form prospectus. So I don't, I don't think it has to be translated. The, the, the question there is taking another angle. So what if it is a website? Normally it's for employees that we would like to look at it. And we put in the website financial statement in English into the website. 
I think it's kind of a gray area, but I wouldn't go all the way to translate financial right. statement to that point, just, just for right. first. I, I, it's I, not really an employee document. I'd wait to get a complaint and see how we could deal with yeah, it. Yeah, but I, I don't If we so. get a complaint, because it's not like, uh, I mean, there, there will be so many businesses that are not compliant at so many levels, it's impossible that, that they, they, they rake everything. So, so I think there, there'll be room for, to play in, in the gray areas, take the time to implement everything. It'll take years. Um, I run a limited partnership business, which BCF does the securities work for. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> uh, do my subscription forms have to be in French for English clients? Is there a letter I can send in English and French, of course, to have their consent or requested for English ratified? So we have the address here where we could bill that client, <laughs> Jill. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's a question that is circulating uh, presently. Uh, we're uh, debating. Group, yeah. yeah, it's debate. We are debating the question. I saw uh, some doctrine on that. A subscription form looks very much as an adhesion contract. Uh, at this moment, um, until we have doctrine or jurisprudence. Uh, I would unfortunately have to uh, propose that it is translated into French uh, and offered to the subscribers uh, because the the sanction otherwise it's it's null and void and it could have uh, catastrophic uh, consequences. So at this moment, uh, until further notice, I would I would uh, I would translate this subscription contract. So next question, can invoices to our customers continue to be bilingual across Canada, including Quebec, or do we need the invoices in Quebec to be in French only? I would say no, they, they bilingual is good as long as uh, uh, English is not more predominant than the French. And, and uh, as long as the French is cheaper than the English. No. <laughs> as long as the price is the same. Yes. Right, right. Of course, but otherwise they would benefit from, from the, uh, the, the cheapest one anyway. Uh, it has been mentioned numerous times that certified translators are required when translating English legal decisions to French. However, can you please confirm, one, are certified translators required for English policies translated to French for private companies? Example, health and safety program manuals? Uh, no. No, no, they're not. No. Uh, two, inapplicable contracts, since our contracts are required to be in French first. If a client requests for the contract in English, does the translation from French to English need to be done by a certified translator? No, no, no. no. It's only the, the procedure, the legal procedure that have to be yeah. certified. So it could be internally, internal, yeah. but, but I of would course. say, however, because I've seen it a few times where um, clients will use Google Translate or other uh, not to want to you know, make any advertising for Google or any other means of translate. It, don't forget that your French can, your French employees will take that version. And if there's a something, a discrepancy and, and will try to gain rights from that version, just make sure it, even if it's not a certified translation, at least it's a proper translation. You know? Right. And, and I would say that, you know, that, that would apply to any contract in any language around the world. We, we, you want to make sure that the translation is, 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 is good uh, because if there are ambiguities, uh, because sometimes legal terms are, are, if they're translated by a layperson, they don't use a proper term and then it just doesn't make sense in, in, in a language. So just uh, make sure translations are always adequate. So a, as a HR professional at a global company, to what degree do we need to provide French translation? We have the company intranet site, global policies, emails that go out to global teams asking for certain actions like acknowledgements of policies, handbooks, et cetera, pay stubs, et cetera. Does absolutely everything have to be offered in French or where is the threshold? So, so I, I would suspect that in the context of this question is that every, is, no, I understand. Sent out to everybody, including some people in Quebec. Yeah, and, and that so you will have to provide it in, in French. So Not anytime necessarily that, globally, but at least to those in, exactly. in, yeah, in Quebec. So uh, the, the ones in, in other co- countries, as I said, there's no extraterritoriality or other provinces. You don't need to. But for your employees in, uh, you, in, in Quebec, you will need to provide the communications in French. Most of our company's clients are Americans. Is it a valid reason to request the knowledge of English for a position? Uh, not to mop the floor, 
But, uh, the, uh, <laughs> yes, you, that's yeah. one of the criteria that you, you will want to use. Remember, I said there's three criteria that you need to demonstrate. So uh, that's one of the criteria. So for, let's say, the position of the person, okay? The salesperson. Do yeah. so you have a salesperson and their clients are all in the U.S.? Well, you know, you'll be able to demonstrate that this person needs to be able to speak English in order to do that. Well, then after that, you have your receptionist. All the clients are calling. You're going to be able to say, like, well, and I need a receptionist that's able to speak English, French, and I have clients also in another country, and she needs to speak a, a German or, or another language. And then you have the guy who's actually uh, passing the broom, let's say, and he says, well, no, he doesn't need to speak, doesn't need to speak English. Where it gets a bit more complicated is you have a machine operators where the machine the troubleshooting uh, software is only available in English so you have your machinist that needs to understand English in order to be able to do the troubleshooting mm. on his machine that is a real issue that I have right now and they're asking us to translate the the, the software and things like that but we can't do it in real time so that's going to be one of the issues but I would say that in this case, you can make the demonstration. There might be other team members that can supply, that can alleviate the problem, but that's going to be uh, that's going to be more the issue. But, but then again, let's say you have uh, three people having the same job, and one of them is bilingual. That's sufficient. But what happens when he goes on vacation? Yeah, and what so, happens if he's sick that day, yeah. and then no one can yeah. fix the machine? Right. Uh, so at least one more question, and we'll see how quick we can answer it. Does, does the requirement to initiate speaking to employees in French apply where the subject matter is, say, a lease agreement in Newfoundland and Labrador? That's a very good question. Good. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a> very... <laughs> I knew you would pass the no. book on that one to me. <laughs> the, okay, uh, does the requirement to initiate speaking to employees in French apply where the subject matter is, say, a lease I would agreement? say that's one of the gray areas that we're talking about. Right. If you're talking about an English lease in, in the New York, in front of Labrador, of course, you're not going to talk about it in French. You know, it's like, uh, or that's you'll talk the, about it bilingually. Well, you know, it's like, and then the employee that's going to have been working on that contract, of course, he's going to be bilingual. Yeah. So that's one of the requirements for the position. So I think that would fall within the exceptions. Okay. So another question. When sending a French version of an employment contract to an employee or a commercial contract to a, a customer, do we need to wait for the employee customer to request English version or could we proactively inform them that they have the option to have the contract in English? I would say yes. Yes, you could do that. Yeah. yeah. I would even say probably you could send them both at the same time. Well, when I'm talking about the side by side for employment, yeah. I'm not talking <laughs> commercial documents. We will be providing both at the same time if that's Sorry. the option that the employer takes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next <laughs> question. Time to wrap up. Oh, yeah. no. That's, a, that's an explanation mark. It's not a question Stop. mark. Um, Our little in house police just told us to wrap up. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all for, for uh, being here with us this morning. I hope we, uh, we, have, we provide you some inf insightful uh, uh, information to, to think about. And, and, and obviously, there are many questions, and, and we don't have all the answers yet. As I mentioned, we're, we're waiting a lot for, the regula for various regulations to, uh, to come into force. Uh, last word, anyone? Sean? Oh, geez, I think I've spoken enough. Well, thank you so much for having joined us and for having asked so many wonderful questions. It was a true pleasure and a great pleasure, uh, lady and gentlemen, yes. to spend this time with you. And thank you to everyone who made it possible. So you thank did a you great job, as her. always. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and thank you, thank you to uh, Leila and Veronique, mm -hmm. who have worked very, very hard to organize this, because uh, we did it yesterday in French, doing it again uh, today. And uh, Thank you very much. Uh, and, and we have our technical guru, yeah. uh, Benoit, yeah. who ben, makes all of ben. this happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe. Do, do we have one minute? Or? Uh, just to say that uh, we have the uh, Bill 101 since 1976. Uh, 77. 77. Uh, we had businesses across the world that came to us. Uh, great companies. Uh, Montreal is absolutely booming. We have that piece of legislation. It could look cumbersome. It is cumbersome. I really personally don't think that it will affect immensely in the real business uh, level, uh, the businesses in Quebec. But of course, we, we have like the issues that we have discussed today. Um, uh, this act is uh, mainly uh, political. Uh, there will be an election in Quebec in October that was done to in 
fact satisfy some of the French speaking uh, people in Quebec, but we will work through it and we will uh, carry on. The yeah. earth won't stop turning. No. Yeah, yeah, I truly believe yeah. businesses will adapt. And as I said, and, you know, we've got great employees here, okay, great productivity. We're, we're, yeah. told to really, we're told to really stop that. now. Okay. Okay. That's it. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today, and we hope to see you soon.